Hi everybody. Uh, today, uh, obviously, is the first day of our online-only instruction. I hope everybody's staying safe. Uh, hope everybody's staying away from people, washing your hands, following uh, directions. Um, what we're going to do today is get started with the lecture. But before we do that, uh, one thing that's important to note here is if you have questions about any of this, uh, contact me. Uh, my cell phone number is on the syllabus. It's also on the uh, update that I just posted to the course site. Uh, so be sure to look at that. Um, also, uh, email uh, works fine. Uh, text message, phone call works fine as well. Uh, also, in the course page for this class, there's a little discussion board. And also, um, to keep the comments about or questions about uh, today's lecture, uh, associated with this lecture, go ahead and post things in the comments section of this video as well if you have questions, and I will go ahead and answer them uh, there uh, if I can, uh, or as they arise anyway. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and get started with today's uh, kind of lecture. It's been a while since we were together, uh, so today what we're going to do is we're going to go through uh, this topic, um, interprocess communication. And essentially, uh, as a quick review since it's been a while, uh, we looked at a couple ways of achieving concurrency. Uh, we had this version of concurrency where we use threads. Uh, we also had processes. And both of those are viable ways of creating current, concurrent solutions. But what are the differences between those? Let's do a quick review of that. So the first, uh, I guess, review point of that is threads versus processes. Threads, let's start with that. Threading, uh, all threads essentially exist in the same process memory space. In other words, uh, if you have a single threaded process, it has a, uh, a memory for code, a memory for data. Uh, it, the one thread uses that memory. If we add another thread, it actually shares that same memory. Even the code is in the same space for code. It's got uh, two different threads of execution, uh, however. And each of those threads of execution have their own separate context. And what a context consists of is basically a stack meaning that when you make local variables, those local variables get stored on the stack, uh, and also a set of registers. In other words, uh, registers consist of, obviously, the working registers for the processor uh, that need to be maintained, but also you have like a program counter that keeps track of where it is in the memory. So essentially, rather than just having one spot in the program where it's keeping track of and one set of registers or one stack that it's keeping track of, it's got two completely separate sets of those. But the global memory space, the where the code and the data live, uh, the file uh, slash IO resources tables that the operating system maintains, those are all shared. So we have one, and in Python, we have one interpreter that's managing all of that, and it's switching between those different threads of execution. So in other words, one will run for a while, get interrupted, the thread of execution will jump to another thread, it'll run for a while until it gets interrupted, and then that'll continue back and forth or amongst however many threads there are. Now, uh, a single threaded solution also does that, but there's only one thread, so it doesn't really have to jump and switch between multiple ones if there's only one, but as soon as we add two, it'll cycle through those uh, individually. Okay, now with multiprocessing though, things are a little bit different. So in multiprocessing, each process has its own process space, which means it's got its own independent space for memory, both for code and data. Also, it has a separate allocation table that's maintained by the operating system for open files, other open resources, uh, or devices. Um, and then each process is managed by the operating system. So in other words, the operating system, rather than keeping track of one process, so if you look in your uh, process table uh, through, uh, if you're on Linux or Unix, you can do the PS command. There'll be one process that shows up. But if you have two of them, you'll see two processes that are separate. With a threaded process, you'll have multiple threads inside of there, but in the process table, you only see one process. Uh, in Windows, if you bring up the device manager and you have more than one process, those will both show up in there uh, together because they're separate processes. Now, in each of those processes could internally have more than one thread, but we're talking about multi-processing here, so multi-processing, more than one process. Now, notice that those processes are completely separate. They have their own memory, both for code and data, and they have their own kind of I.O. allocation for files um, and things like that. Now, uh, 
one of the things uh, to note about that that's important is that uh, processes versus threads, is, here's like a little picture of that, is that the implications of that are that threads, because they share, let me move the mouse pointer here, if you notice, uh, here's a single threaded uh, program, here's one thread, it's got its registers, its stack, it's never going to jump between that, but as the program runs, it's going to run through the code here, maybe it'll loop, it'll go back, it'll do stuff in here, but there's really only one thread running at one time, it'll never switch away from that. And it's using the code, the data, uh, the files up here associated with that. Now, if we have a multi-threaded process, though, it's same code, same data, same file table, all inside of one process. But now we have more than one thread. And it's going to kind of switch between these. When does it switch? Well, it'll switch whenever it decides uh, that one of them has run for long enough that it needs to switch to another one. Or if one of these reaches a I.O. event where it needs to block or you call a sleep function where we tell it to block, then it will switch to another one of these. So in other words, each of these threads will be in a state of either ready to run, waiting for something, or actively running. There'll only be one actively running at a time. And the Python interpreter in this case, one interpreter running inside of here, switching between these different code things. Uh, to, it's still concurrent, but it's only one process that's sharing all this. Now that can be convenient because accessing global data uh, or accessing a, a file from in different processes, the same file from different processes becomes relatively easy because these are all sharing that. And that since they all have their own stack space and their own registers, it, it really, as long as we observe concurrent, uh, avoiding concurrent pitfalls uh, with how we access this data or these files, then things will, the interpreter will automatically handle switching back and forth between these and all their local variables are theirs, all their registers are theirs, so there won't be anything that goes wrong unless we do something that's a concurrency problem. Now, with multiprocessing though, looking over here on the right side of this uh, slide, we've got this uh, kind of a duplicate of one of these, but repeated multiple times. Now notice that the implication there, the thing that that uh, causes, is we've got uh, this situation where every one of these processes has their own has its own code, its own data, and its own set of files, which means that we can't really share this. So if this thread changes some data in this code, none of the other ones processes can see that. And if this one makes a change or writes some data to its code or its data space, none of these ones can see it. So in other words, the data is all completely independent and isolated from the other processes, which means that threads can easily share data. Processes are kind of isolated from one another and independent. And that has a uh, uh, number of implications. Look at that. Let's look at those implications. All right, first off, threads can share data uh, directly, makes it easy for them to work on cooperative solutions. Uh, there's low overhead for creating threads because we're not having the operating system create a whole new process. Uh, the other implication, though, so convenience is certainly on the side of threads, but also and also kind of the low overhead nature of it. But also, notice they have to share that single in interpreter. So we have, in Python, we have one interpreter. It has a what's called a global interpreter lock that kind of gets cycled between each of the threads. So it's while it's a concurrent solution. It's not really parallel. Uh, so if you have something where you have an I.O. bound process, we can still benefit from those solutions or something that's more convenient, we benefit from it. But we're not really having truly uh, parallel execution with a multi-threaded Python program. Now, with processes, though, they can't share data directly. And that means we have to use other mechanisms of getting them to communicate to work on a cooperative solution. Uh, so in other words, we can't just change a variable and have the other th or other processes see it. We have to have them communicate with each other in some way, which is a little more complex. Now, the other thing to note here is that the uh, threads had a low overhead. Processes have a higher overhead for creating them. And that's because it's happening not inside of the thread itself, but in the operating system. So in the operating system level, uh, that's much more... Um, expensive uh, computationally because to create a new process we have to duplicate the one we're in 
and then replace the uh, code with the code of the new process. And all of that takes CPU cycles, takes time, takes interacting with the operating system and making operating system level calls. So that is all uh, much more expensive than creating a thread. But because each process has its own independent interpreter, that has this side effect of allowing truly parallel execution on a processor that has more than one core or an architecture that has more than one CPU in it. And the other thing about pro using processes is because they communicate uh, with each other and they're isolated and independent. Notice that makes it more easy to move an architecture uh, into a system that is scaled across multiple systems, something like a, a cloud-based system or a uh, what would be called like a, a transputer or a um, kind of cluster of machines. If we have a process-based system, that's usually easier to migrate and scale across multiple systems and something that uses threads. All right. Now, communicating between uh, processes, it because they don't share memory, becomes important. And this is a fairly dense slide, so I'm going to just touch on the highlights here as we go through this. But uh, processes have that tremendous advantage of being truly able to be parallel and being easier to migr migrate across a uh, kind of cluster of machines rather than a single uh, computer system. But because of that lack of shared memory, we need some alternate way to get them to interact with each other if we're going to make a cooperative solution to some problem. So uh, how do we get multiple processes to communicate? or share data, or interact with each other without having a shared memory? Well, there are a few options available uh, to work with, and we're going to look at a couple of those today, but here's a list of uh, ones. We've seen some of this before uh, in previous lectures, but let's start off with queues. So queue, we, we've used that before. So typically a FIFO, but we also could have priority queues uh, or first in, last out queues, uh, like a stack. But the primary usage is a FIFO. In other words, you have multiple processes. They stick things in the queue. Uh, they take things out of the queue. And it sits kind of in a space where multiple processes, even though they have independent memory, can all access this kind of shared queue that sits between them. Uh, pipes are kind of like a queue, except that it's only two-ended. And pipes uh, are simplified versions of queues. It's a two-ended communication mechanism uh, and a if you think about an actual pipe, you can stick things in one end, pull things out of the other end, a lot like a queue, uh, except that a pipe only has two ends. In other words, you have one process connected to one end, another one connected to the other end. So it's kind of like a direct communication line between just two processes rather than uh, an object that exists where multiple processes can stick things in, take things out. And then there's some other ones here that we're going to get to. Uh, they're value slash array objects, manager objects. Uh, those are kind of specialized uh, methods of sharing data between things where uh, it's not really shared data in the sense of it is with how it works with threads, but it allows us to effectively share data. And behind the scenes is like a little server that runs on, for example, a manager. Uh, you make changes in one uh, part of the code it automatically changes it in the uh, talks to communicates to that, changes it in the manager. And then when the other parts of the code access it, they ask the manager uh, for that data. And so we're going to talk about this. There's also a thing called C types, which is kind of a lower level shared memory uh, thing where we can actually truly share memory through something like that, even in Python. Uh, sockets. Uh, sockets are kind of like the, the language of the web. So when you're using a website, uh, connecting to a website, downloading things, uh, even watching this video, sockets are involved in that. But we can actually communicate not necessarily across the internet, but from one program on a machine to another program on that same machine, or one process to another process using a local socket connection. Uh, you can also note, it, note that with sockets, if you use sockets, that becomes very easy to move one process from not the local machine, but somewhere else on the internet or somewhere else on a cluster of machines. Uh, and then there's some other frameworks that kind of surround some of those other types of methods uh, that we talked about above that make it easy uh, and standardized. And one of those is a thing called MPI, which is kind of a message pass, a standardized message passing interface. Um, we'll probably look at that later on the semester. Uh, 
But today what we're going to do is we're just going to look at a couple of these. Later on we'll look at the other ones. All right, so let's start off uh, at the top with queues. So let's do a quick review of queues. So here's the Python code uh, for uh, setting up a queue. So notice that in this code, relatively small amount of code here, that the main thing that we did is in our main program, we made this queue, main queue equal multiprocessing.queue. That's a queue object that's inside of the multiprocessing uh, module that we've imported. So we're making a queue that can talk between multiple processes. And then the next thing that we have on that is here's this function that I've kind of abstracted, just do some stuff here. And here what we're doing is I'm using the queue as a way to uh, act as a way to gather return values from a number of processes. So down here what I did is I create a 10 processes. So here's a process. I'm creating it with this my process thing. And at the very end of that process running, it's sticking some result into this shared queue. So notice this is pseudocode, so if you run this, it won't do anything because we don't have a result and there's no code here where it says do stuff here. But the idea is pretty simple. The process runs, it has an answer to report, it sticks the answer into the queue. So it writes the value into the queue by putting it into there. And then in the main, what we do is we start all the processes, we wait for them all to finish, and then we just go through and pull the result for each of those processes out of the main queue. So notice the way we interact with the queue, uh, as a review, we create it, and then once it's created, we can put things in. Notice we have, in this case, 10 different processes putting things in. And then down here, we have the main process. So here's the main. And what it's doing is it's going through, and 10 times it's pulling out the results. It's getting the result for every one of those other processes that ran. So these are processes, even though they are completely separate now, so we've got 10 different processes, all completely separate with their own memory, their own code, their own file IO. Uh, they're all accessing that one uh, kind of shared uh, queue. Now to do that, notice you can't access it like a global variable. In order to access it, we have to do that in a little bit different way. And the way that we're going about doing that is by passing it to that uh, process when we create it. So in other words, I'm creating a new process my process, and I'm passing to it a reference to that queue. So now it has access, each of those processes has access to that when they get spawned. And that's pretty much it for uh, queues. Now, let's continue on here and kind of review that quickly, and then we'll take a little break, and we'll come back and we'll finish up with uh, a couple other methods here. So to review queues, we basically can access uh, by any processes that have access to the object. And multiple, we could use more than one queue if we want. So in other words, we're not limited to one queue. You could have one queue to talk from processes to uh, each other. You could have another queue that talks from processes back to the main. You could have a subset of processes that have a queue that they use between them. It's up to us to use them however many and in whatever kind of configuration that we want. And then the next uh, kind of thing on this is that all the entities are interacting with the queue can either put items in or they can get items from it. So it's very open-ended for how we can interact with it. Uh, one of the other things is how we're using queues here. That can also be used for other kind of concurrency control uh, synchronization and communication methods that we saw in the past. For example, locks, uh, reentrant locks, condition variables. Uh, semaphores, bonded semaphores, barriers, events, all of those things can work the same way. The main thing to know here when you're using those with a uh, process, though, is you cannot use them as a shared variable like you can with a thread. In other words, you have to pass them to the process when it gets created in order for them to be accessed in that way. Okay, so moving on now to... Uh, Another mechanism besides queues, this is one we haven't seen before, uh, and this is a, a method called pipes. And what a pipe is, it's kind of like a simplified version of a queue, but you'll notice that uh, pipes kind of have existed for a really long time uh, as an operating system communication mechanism. We're going to see that in action here in just a second. But the general concept is that a pipe has two ends, has a read end and a write end. Uh, some pipes are duplex, meaning they're bidirectional. They read and write from both ends. But the general idea of a pipe is it's got two ends. It's got an end you can put data into, an end you can pull data out of. 
a lot like a queue, except that one process is going to be connected to the read end and one process is going to be connected to the right end. In other words, it's kind of a peer to peer uh, connection directly between two processes. So this little picture down here, uh, we've process one, it can put data in the right end and then that data will sit inside of the pipe until it gets pulled out of the other end by process two. So think of this whole thing with the uh, right, this little red box here and the green box here as being the pipe that the operating system is maintaining. And then here's a process that can write to that. Here's a process that can read from that. Now, in practice, let's take a quick look at that, is operating systems use this all the time. So for example, Windows, Unix, uh, OS X, uh, Android, which is actually kind of built on top of Linux, all of those uh, operating systems, even embedded operating systems, have this concept of uh, pipes. And one of the things, places that's used a lot is things like this. So in Unix, uh, you can kind of link together on a single command line multiple commands. So here we're catting file.txt. We're piping that, this vertical bar symbol is the pipe symbol. We're piping that to this other process called grep, which I'm passing Yoast to. And then we're piping that to word count, w, the WC utility, which is word count tac L, which counts the number of lines. But notice that the way that this kind of pipeline of commands works is it does it through separate processes. And so this is actually, this one command line is going to launch three different processes. The kind of cat process is going to be process one. And what cat does is it just copies the contents of that specified file to standard out, uh, normally to the console. In other words, if I left all of this uh, stuff here off and just had the cat file.txt, we would see the contents of that file show up on the screen. But what we're saying is rather than having it show up on the console or the screen, we're saying take the output that would have gone there and connect it to the input to standard in of this grep command. What grep command does is it looks for specific patterns in input and it will pass through lines that have that pattern in them. So in other words, we're saying, hey, every time I find this pattern Yoast, uh, pass that through to the output. So it's kind of like a filter. It acts like a filter uh, for data that comes in. Uh, and then only sends the filtered data going out. Now the last one here, word count, process three, that just counts uh, the number of lines. We did a tech L, which has number of lines. So in other words, what this is gonna say is how many lines in this uh, file.txt have the word Yoast in them. So if this was, for example, the class schedule for next semester, I could see how many entries have my name in them uh, somewhere. And grep is a really complicated command that can, it's really powerful, you can do a lot with it. Uh, in fact, we could have you put the file name directly in that command without using cat. But the cool thing about this uh, configuration like this, oh, hold on, the cat is trying to get on the keyboard here. The cool thing about this configuration uh, or this method is it allows us to have a really complicated set of processes that all get linked together all through the command line. And there are actually commands in Unix that allow us to teat there's a T command that allows us to split a pipe into data stream into two different uh, directions. So you can take what was one data stream and now make it two, where it's duplicating those and send them. So one of them is counting lines. The other one is looking for a different pattern, a sub pattern. Uh, but those are actually, uh, this is actually spawning three processes when you do this. And the command interpreter is what's doing that. How do they get linked together? Uh, every program has a standard in, a standard out stream by default. It just links the out of one to the in of the next one. Let's take a quick look at what a picture of that would look like. All right, so here's that command again. Cat file.txt, pipe with grep yoast, pipe with word count tac l. So looking at that, process one gets launched and it loads up that file, would have gone to the screen, now gets stuffed into the pipe. And on the other end of that pipe is process two, which standard in normally would have come from the keyboard of the console. Now it's getting that from this pipe. And where's the, what's, where'd the information in the pipe come from? It came from process one sticking things in there. So in other words, we're having process one communicate its output to the input of process two. And then processes two output that would have gone to the screen if we left the word count off there is now going into word count, which is just counting the lines, and then its output is just gonna be the count of the number of the lines. So for example, if we ran this on schedule, uh, the schedule for next semester in the fall, it would probably say something like four, which would be the number of classes that I'm teaching. So 
this allows us to do something with just a command line that we would normally would have had to have written a program for. And the thing that allows that to happen is the ability to have pipes communicate between these different processes. It's a super clever, uh, really slick uh, method of doing things. And uh, this works in uh, Windows as well. Uh, maybe some of you have done that, for example. Um, I'll mention that here briefly, but notice it works in Linux. Linux is just a kind of a uh, version of Unix. So Linux, Windows, Mac, other operating systems support this concept of pipes. Now, uh, the one thing that's probably worth mentioning is that while we could do that through the OS, through the command line, let me back up just one second and take a look at that. So while we could do it through a command line in the operating system, could do it in Windows as well, uh, and when you're compiling code and route, like piping it to uh, uh, the output of it to some location as you write uh, programs, this kind of thing shows up a lot. But the we can also do that in code. So we can write our code so that it manages the pipe so we don't have to go back to the command line and type something in ourselves to hook some process that we want up to another process. We could have that all happen through code. So let's look at how we're going to do that. All right, so to do that, uh, there, through code, what we're going to do is we're going to use, again, part of the multiprocessing module in uh, Python. It has a .pipe object uh, or class built in that works a lot like the OS pipes. And the way that it works is there's only really one difference, and that's that the uh, pipes in uh, multiprocessing by default uh, are duplex, meaning that you can both stick data in and pull data out from one end. So it's essentially behind the scenes, you can think of it as like two pipes. You have one going this way, one going that way. Uh, and so data that gets put in from process one on this side will come out to process two. And then data that gets put in for process two on this side will come out for process one. So in other words, it's like a two directional thing by default. Now, when you invoke that pipe class, it returns two what are called connection objects. It returns a pair. So in other words, you say, hey, create a pipe. It says, OK, here's one end, and here's the other end. So it will actually give you both ends of the pipe. And then what you can do from there is you can give one end of the pipe to one process, one to the other process when you create them, and now they have a way to talk to each other. But the pipe has to be created uh, before those processes get created or other, it has to have some way of getting the ends of the pipe to the respective processes so they can use it. Now, uh, pipe does support this optional parameter duplex, but by default it's true. So you get this kind of uh, duplex bi-directional communication mechanism. But you can set it to false to have it behave more like a traditional operating system level pipe. But if you do set it to false, then only connection one can receive. This is the read end of the pipe and connection to can only send, so that's the right end of the pipe. So in other words, uh, by default, we don't have to worry about it. We can just create it and then have whichever one read and whichever one write that we want. But if we want to behave more like a traditional uh, unidirectional pipe, then we can set duplex to false. And then as long as we get the read and write ends correct, then that will work. OK, now let's look at an example code of making a pipe. And here is uh, some example code uh, for you to look at. So notice that at the start of this, uh, again, it's the only thing we had to import was multiprocessing. So we import that. And then what we're going to do is down here in my main, I'm going to go ahead and create the pipe. So when I create that pipe, I wind up with two connection objects, connection one and connection two, I call them here, pipecon one, pipecon two. And then what I did is I create two processes. I'm creating a producer process and a consumer process. And what I'm doing is I'm passing to the producer this first connection, connection one, and to the consumer, I'm passing connection two. So now those two processes have kind of the two different ends of that pipe. So if you think of that uh, pipe, we have one process with accessing one end, the other one accessing the other end. And essentially, after I've created those processes, now once they get started, they have the access to their respective end of that pipe uh, object. All right. So we wait for them to finish, we join them, and then we're done. But notice what's happening here inside of the code is the producer is kind of sleeping for a little while, picking one of these, or choosing a message in this list, 
uh, one at a time going through the messages and then waiting between one and two seconds randomly and then sending that into the pipe. And the way you put stuff into the pipe is just pipe.send puts that data into the pipe. On the other end, whenever data shows up in the pipe, pipe.receive gets it. And now I'm just printing that out on the other end. So what's happening is notice I have two processes that have this totally independent memory space. They can't share variables. They can't share uh, code. They can't share file IO, but they each have an end of this pipe object. One of them is sticking messages in. One of them is pulling messages out. So kind of like a, you can think of that kind of like a little uh, hole in the door of a jail cell where you can stick messages through uh, and one jail cell connects to it. So even though they're completely uh, independent and separate from each other, they have this simple communication mechanism between the two. All right, so pipes versus queues. Uh, they're similar, uh, but pipes only allow two, allow two endpoints. Uh, by default, they allow duplex communication, at least in uh, Python operating system pipes generally are simplex uh, by default. But the idea here is that uh, with these two endpoints being created and only two endpoints, we cannot have more than one thread writing to, for example, the read end, write end, or more than one thread reading from the read end like we can with a queue. And that's important uh, to note that it's not safe to do so. So for example, if you have something like our example we did with the queue where you have 10 processes and you want to get return values from all of them, you don't want to use a pipe for that. You want to use a queue for that because it's not thread safe, not process safe to have more than one process either doing a reading operation or writing operation from a pipe. In other words, only two endpoints, only one thread uh, or one process at a time talking to those endpoints. And that's a really important thing about pipes. The second thing is um, with queues is those allow multiple producers and consumers and multiple processes can put things into the queue. Multiple processes can pull things out of the queue. And it's also designed to be thread safe and process safe. So any number of processes can read or write to that queue uh, simultaneously. We don't even have to worry about locking it ourselves outside of that. It does it itself. Uh, and you can emulate a pipe with a queue by only using one writer process, one reader process. So in other words, if we only ever access it with two processes, one on each end, then we're never going to have, uh, we're going to have something that works exactly like a pipe does. And then you might ask the question, well, if we can just use a queue as if it were a pipe, then why even have pipes? But the answer is that pipes have been around a long time in operating systems. They're built into the operating system itself. Uh, and the pipes in the multiprocessing unit or multiprocessing module in uh, Python sit on top of the operating system's pipes. So it's actually much faster to use pipes. Uh, in fact, if you were to write code, you'd see something that's like probably three to five times faster to perform communication between two processes using pipes than with uh, a queue object. And if you have an application that is performance uh, dependent or sensitive, then, and you only have two processes that need to communicate with each other, then use pipes for that. All right. Now, one of the things is that Python does have the ability to use uh, pipes without using the multiprocessing module. Uh, in fact, you can import OS. You can call os.pipe. That'll give you a read end and a write end. This is like a traditional operating system pipe. Uh, but note that you should probably use the multiprocessing version of that. This is considered less portable uh, since it's part of the OS module. It's dependent on the operating system you're sitting upon to uh, implement that properly. And so just keep in mind that we could use pipes without using the multiprocessing modules version of it directly. Behind the scenes, the multiprocessing version is kind of abstracted that away for us, uh, which is considered more portable. It might be faster to use the OS pipe. Uh, I have not tested that. I have tested... Uh, pipes versus queues, though. And in my version, uh, the pipes ended up being about three and a half times faster than queues. Okay. Now, managers. A manager is uh, a little bit different animal altogether in that it's a, it's not, you probably shouldn't think of a manager as like a 
communication or connection mechanism between two processes. It's a kind of a, a way to create a thing that allows us to share data uh, in a process and safe and thread safe way. So what a manager is, think of it kind of like the, if you think back to that monitor concept that we had previously in the semester with like the uh, garden turnstile problem or the bank account problem, uh, that's a cat tail by the way, uh, getting in front of the camera there. But the, if you think back to that monitor concept that we implemented earlier, it had like this kind of guard mechanisms around data so the only way to access the data was through kind of a, a, a read and a write, or in the case of the bank account through deposit and withdrawal. But what, if we think about that same kind of concept with data, you think, well, data, you can either get the contents of it or you can set the contents of it, kind of like a variable. You have some variable that lives in memory. You can either put data into it or you can pull data out of it and it just has to store that. So what the uh, manager concept is, it basically, uh, abstracts that away so we can just have a data object that we just access and it kind of controls the access for us so that's why it's called a manager you think of a uh, a manager for a, a rock star or something controls access to them somebody wants to talk to them the manager says hold on then they let them in they have their conversation and then the manager pushes the person back out of the room again and so that's kind of the concept that we have here for uh this, except that in the case of a manager in Python, the data is going to be look like it's shared, but it's really kind of kept in this separate managed location that then allows the multiple processes to access it for either reading or changing, updating. So how do we create a manager? Import multiprocessing, multiprocessing.manager, and that creates this manager object. That manager object, one of the cool things about that in Python is that these managers support uh, namespaces, and a namespace it's kind of like when you import a process, like uh, multiprocessing itself up here. It has multiprocessing dot, and then you access an item inside of that namespace. So using a manager, you can say, hey, take this manager that I created, and then make a new namespace in it. And I'm going to call it my namespace. But you could call it anything you want. You could call it like uh, game settings, or you could call it uh, user characteristics, or you could call it like anything that you want to be shared, you can make a namespace for that, uh, server settings, whatever you want it to be. So you can make more than one namespace inside of a manager, but notice that this namespace is now associated with this manager, so my namespace. So once it's been created, we can just now start adding attributes to it. And attributes uh, we can add just like a variable. So my namespace.count equals zero, my namespace.item list uh, equal empty list. So this is now added to data items to this namespace. So once the namespace has been created, the idea there is that then we can pass it to each of the processes that we create that need to access it. So kind of similar to a queue, we create it first, we put the data items in it, and then once we have those in that namespace, now we can give that uh, namespace to those individual processes, and then they can access this data. So now we have, notice if I give this namespace, to let's say two or three or 10 or 100 or 1,000 processes, uh, then they all will have access to this count attribute, this count variable. And that count variable that we see right here, as one changes the value, the other ones, when they access that count through that namespace, they'll see that its value change. So this is kind of like a shared variable. And we don't really have to worry about locking around accessing that because the namespace, whenever I try to set this, it'll lock, it'll update it, it'll unlock. And in fact, whenever I read it, it'll lock, give us the value, unlock. So the, it handles, the manager handles all the concurrent access to this for us. Uh, there are a couple idiosyncrasies about this uh, related to this that we'll see in a second. But let's uh, look at an example here. But the idea is since every process can access the data items that are in that namespace, they're effectively shared, and they're shared in this thread-safe and process-safe manner. All right, let's look at a, uh, a more complete uh, example here. All right, so import multiprocessing. Essentially, I have, this is kind of like uh, simulating the garden turnstiles thing that we talked about, I think, in our first class, actually. So we have 10 people entering. We've got 10 people leaving. Now, I haven't added the logic here to make sure people can't leave when no one's entered. Uh, this is just adding 10, subtracting 10. So when both of these conclude, 
we should have zero uh, count of zero. And then I also have this uh, namespace.log that I added to that. It's like a list, empty list. And I've added, uh, essentially I start the processes. They both are given access to that same namespace that has count and log in it. And then they can share that count. So when this thing concludes, I start them both, wait for them to complete. And then at the end, I print out the count and I print out the log. Now, something interesting happens here, though. You notice the count comes out correct. It's zero. And it has been updated. This one has added 10. This is subtracted 10. So zero plus 10 minus 10. Uh, no matter what order these happen in, notice they're going to sleep for varying amounts of time. We're going to end up with zero at the end. So that's correct. They're all sharing that. So even though we're accessing count, this ns.count, in two different processes, they have their own memory. They're sharing that same variable because the manager and the namespace in that manager is keeping track of that. But the log, we would expect it to see entered uh, left, entered left. We'd expect to see various combinations of uh, enter and leave happening here, but we don't. It's empty. And there's a reason for that, uh, that that's, there's an error in our code. That The reason for that has to do with what namespace kinds of things namespaces can uh, propagate the changes to. And in this case, we passed in a list, and that list, okay, let's go to the next slide here, and then I'll explain it. But the actual problem that we're seeing is that list is a standard Python list back here in the code. And that's a, uh, a, a mutable object. And when a, you have a mutable object, its reference won't change, but the data inside of it will. And so the problem is that managed or objects that are contained or managed by a manager can't propagate changes made to mutable objects that are inside that container. In other words, uh, that I have this list, and that list has a reference, and behind the scenes stuff will change, but the manager can't tell it's changed the data, so it doesn't propagate the changes. So in other words, uh, if we have a normal mutable Python list, then any changes are not propagated because the manager has no way of knowing that that data has changed, and it can't sit there and constantly look at the data and see, oh, somebody changed it. So what it does is just none of the changes to that list get propagated. So let's go back for just one second here. So the reason this list is empty is because it started out empty, and it's a mutable object with the same reference. So neither of these, uh, the, are, even though we changed it and appended things to it, the manager doesn't know that that happened, and it can't propagate the changes. Now, there is a way to fix that. It's very easy to fix that. We only have to change one line of code here. And that is uh, the way that we could change that there's a couple ways you could do that. One, you could completely destroy the list and create it every time, but that could be really slow. Uh, you, so you could destroy it, create a new list that's the new one with the thing added, and then assign that. Uh, but that's going to be slow. So there's another better way to do that, and that is use a manager.list type or manager.list object instead of a standard Python list object. And what that is, it's still mutable, but it's a, a kind of list that the manager knows how to update. So... Uh, also note that that's true for other uh, mutable Python objects like dictionaries. If you want to have a shared dictionary between two different things, we'd have to do manager.dict uh, instead of manager.list here. Um, but a mutable object type, such as strings, uh, numbers, they don't have that requirement. So we don't have to use any special types for that. So let's look at the fix for that program that we just uh, created before. Really, it's just one line of code. Remember before, this was just a standard my namespace dot log equal empty list. So we just had an empty list there. Now we've got my namespace dot log equal my manager dot list. That's saying, hey, make that a list that is managed, uh, or that's a, a list from this manager object. And now that manager knows how to uh, see the changes. So now one line of code, just half of a line of code really we changed. And now notice the count is still zero, but now the log contains uh, all of the kind of entry and leaving data that things have. So keep that in mind. If you, in other words, if you're using a manager and you have data that doesn't look like it's being updated or it's not propagating correctly, look at what kind of object that is, what kind of data it is, and uh, see if you can uh, convert that to something like this. Again, simple data objects, numbers, uh, strings, uh, not a problem, but if you have lists or dictionaries, uh, or uh, other types of uh, mutable objects, then you're going to need to 
use something like this. Now, there are a whole lot of other things we can do with managers. We're going to look at that a little bit later, but I think that's enough for today, so we'll go and stop there. Uh, one of the things to keep in mind, if you do have questions, uh, feel free to post them on the uh, kind of comments section of this video. Uh, also, uh, keep in mind you can email me, you can send me text messages or uh, call me. Uh, also, feel free, uh, there's a discussion board that's on the course page. If you have questions, you can post things there. Uh, that might be a little easier in some cases than posting things on this video, but uh, however you ask questions, uh, feel free to ask those. And what we're going to do next class is we're going to look a little more um, at some of these interprocess communication mechanisms. And then we're going to have uh, some lab time. So I'm going to post a lab and you're going to get to play with this a little bit. Uh, at least that's the plan for now. All right. So until then, stay safe. Uh, follow directions. Stay away from other people unless you know that they're safe. Uh, and wash your hands. All right. That's it. Thanks.